Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live webinar, Benefits of Steel and Accelerated Bridge Construction, presented by Mike Kulmo of CME Associates. Today is June 19, 2018. My name is Nate Goner with AISC's Continuing Education Group, and I will be moderating today's presentation. I want to thank everyone for joining us today. We hope it's a valuable experience for you. Uh, I'm going to go over a few announcements and then we'll have our presentation. All participants for today's webinar are in listen-only mode. You may have noticed that you have two options for listening to today's presentation, listening through your computer streamed over the internet or listening through the phone line. This phone option is available throughout the presentation, so if you have any technical difficulties with the streamed audio, you always have the option to switch over to the phone. Although everyone is in listen-only mode, this live webinar will be interactive. You can submit questions at any time by typing them into the chat feature located on the left of your screen. We will answer questions live at the end of the presentation today as time allows. You can also use the chat feature in case you do have any technical difficulties with the streamed audio. We will respond and do our best to help you with those issues. You might also notice the raise hand feature um, on the left of your screen. Please resist the urge to use that feature. The best way to communicate with us is with the chat feature. We see all the questions that you type into the chat. For legal reasons, I must announce that today's presentation is being recorded. <coughs> AISC is a registered provider with AIA, the American Institute of Architects, and today's presentation is registered with AIA for continuing professional education. In conjunction with that registration, we need to inform you of the description of today's presentation as well as its learning objectives. We had these slides on the screen leading up to the presentation, so hopefully you've had a chance to view all of that information. We do intend to fulfill these learning objectives. For those of you seeking PDH credit, please be informed that everyone at your connection today is eligible to receive a certificate for attending. Within two business days of today's session, you will receive an email with information on how to report your attendance and ultimately claim your PDHs. You will receive this email from the address registration at AISC.org. That email that you receive will contain a link to an online form. Using that link along with your AISC website, username, and password, you'll be able to fill out the form for you and everyone else at your connection. Filling out that form will be how you will report attendance and receive your PDH certificates via email. Again, that email will be coming from registration at AISC.org. I'll touch again uh, at the end of the presentation as a reminder and in case there are any remaining questions on PDHs. But for now, that is my final announcement. I would like to introduce today's speaker. Michael P. Como is a bridge engineer with over 34 years of experience in the design and construction of bridges, and he has been responsible for directing a structures and transportation design department for new expressway bridges, bridge rehabilitation, and related highway structures. He has special expertise in the fields of accelerated bridge construction technologies as well as steel bridges. He is the principal investigator for NCHRP Project 12102, which included the development of the 2017 ASHTO Guide Specifications for Accelerated Bridge Construction. He is also the principal investigator for NCHRP Project 1298, which included the development of the Guideline for Prefabricated Bridge Elements and System Tolerances, as well as the Guidelines for Dynamic Effects for Bridge Systems. Both of these were published in 2018. Mr. Como holds a bachelor's degree in civil engineering and a master's degree in structural engineering, both from the University of Connecticut. He is a licensed professional engineer. Mike, thank you for being here, and I will now turn the floor over to you. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm here today uh, to give a presentation uh, entitled Benefits of Steel and Accelerated Bridge Construction. 
The, uh, <clears throat> the portions of this presentation are culled from other presentations I've given. So if you see me speak at uh, accelerated bridge construction conferences, you may see certain portions of this might look a little familiar. However, uh, as Nate just said, we're looking to uh, include additional information that's a result of the NCHRP um, research projects that we recently completed, uh, both all dealing with accelerated bridge construction. So uh, <clears throat> I'd like to bring everyone up to speed and what the latest is in these technologies. And really, the biggest thing is how can we use structural steel to our advantage uh, in the world of accelerated bridge construction? Often we, we equate accelerated construction with precast concrete. And hopefully today at the end of this uh, training session, you'll realize that steel has a very prominent role in the accelerated construction world and has definite advantages for certain situations. Current status of ABC in the United States is, is quite uh, promising. ABC has become uh, commonplace. Uh, if you asked me a question 10 years ago, I would have said ABC would probably be a novelty or maybe just a, a tool in the toolbox for bridge engineers to use to bridge, uh, build bridges in certain conditions, certain situations. But really, uh, the DOTs have really embraced accelerated bridge construction. Uh, a lot of prodding from Federal Highway gives them a lot of credit. Uh, but now ABC, virtually every state has an ABC program in place. And literally thousands of bridges have been built using ABC across the country. Uh, Federal Highway used to keep track to see how many bridges were built, and they gave up when they got to about four or 5,000 projects, and this was a number of years ago. So there's really a lot of work out there. So this is not new stuff. But our goal right now in the industry is to get people to be more efficient at what they, they do with ABC and to make projects more successful. Uh, prefabrication is the key to accelerated construction. We'll talk uh, today on a different types of prefabrication that can be used. And again, as I said before, most people think ABC is precast. That's really not the case. Steel definitely is a big part of the solution. So why consider steel elements? Well, quite simply, concrete elements can get very heavy. So in a lot of these ABC projects, we're using heavy equipment, cranes, um, transporters of certain types. And the weight really can become an issue in a lot of these projects, especially as we start pushing span lengths out. Uh, Steel is very forgiving when it comes to accommodating lifting and handling forces. Uh, we move these bridges. We'll demonstrate today in this training session that uh, there are some significant forces exerted on the structure during the move. Uh, concrete has issues with cracking. It can be problematic. Not to say you can't do it in concrete. You just have to be much more careful. Uh, another uh, advantage to steel is the span weight limitations. We typically are in the process of rebuilding existing highways for the most part, which is really where ABC comes into play where uh, we always say replacing a bridge with traffic on it is like changing the oil in your car motor with the engine still running. We have to replace these bridges quickly, but we also have to deal with issues like uh, vertical clearance issues on older highways, that we need to do our best to increase vertical clearances. Steel has, in many cases, has uh, advantages where we can create a thinner superstructure to create more vertical clearance. Uh, connections can be faster. Uh, I, I noted their field bolting it can be a relatively slow process, but today we're going to show you ways of doing bridges uh, using ABC methods without significant field bolting. And then lastly, steel can be fabricated with a very high degree of accuracy, uh, quite a bit more uh, smaller tolerances than when compared to precast concrete. And that just equates to better fit up in the field. If you're trying to do a project very quickly, uh, having something not fit in the field can be a real issue with regard to these very tight construction schedules that we're talking about. So in the world of accelerated bridge construction, we have uh, two main types of uh, construction that fall into the realm of accelerated bridge construction. The first thing I'm going to talk about are bridge systems. The term bridge systems was uh, developed by Federal Highway to describe a case where you build the entire bridge or large portions of the bridge off-site or adjacent to the bridge and you move them in in one piece. Uh, the photos on the right depict this, the two most common approaches used, where the, uh, the first one is what we call self-propelled modular transporters. These are high-capacity trailers that can move a bridge uh, down normal city streets. Uh, that particular bridge in the upper photo is from Utah DOT. Uh, roughly, uh, I believe that was about a million and one-half pound uh, bridge moved about a mile on a roadway using these machines. And in the lower picture is what we call a lateral slide, where the bridge is slid in on rails, uh, either using cables or hydraulic systems uh, to get the bridge installed quickly. So we'll talk first in this presentation. We'll, we'll focus in on bridge systems and how steel plays a role in the bridge system uh, world. 
Another thing that is beneficial, as, as I said before, steel is lighter than concrete and can handle large force reversals. These photos really demonstrate that. If you, the lower left photo is the Providence River Bridge. It is a 400 foot span tied arch and it was lifted. If you look carefully, they actually are sitting on self-propelled modular transporters on these barges that were shipped 12 miles to the site. This bridge was installed in one day once the, the uh, piers were, were completed. Uh, but as you can imagine, lifting a tide arch, in this case, the lift points are 100 feet from the permanent support points. Uh, it, the bridge does not like to be lifted this way. You'll see the brown vertical elements. Those are temporary braces that were installed. These braces are carrying literally approximately a million pounds each. Uh, this is the kind of forces we're dealing with here. In this case, it was about a six million pound bridge lift. Steel can handle these kind of reversals. The force reversals that occurred in the top and bottom cords of that tight arch were significant. Uh, the bottom cord went from tension to compression. Top cord went from uh, compression. Bottom cord went from tension to compression. The top cord went from compression to tension. In addition, we exerted some significant bending stresses into the, the uh, uh, members as well. Uh, steel can handle these kind of things. It's a wonderful material that can handle large stress reversals and large force reversals without any problems. The photos on the right show other cases where you're lifting a bridge with these transporters, and you'll notice that the, the bridges are being lifted away from their final supports, which generates negative bending moments in the system. Again, steel has a tendency to be able to handle these negative forces, these negative bending moments uh, better than concrete in most situations. So let's talk about SPMT bridge moves. Uh, an SPMT is a unit called a self-propelled modular transporter. Um, and in a bridge move, I'll talk about that in a few minutes in more detail, but the question people ask me all the time is, okay, if I'm going to move a bridge with SPMTs, what are the responsibilities of the designer? What are the responsibilities of the contractor? So I added this slide in to define in general what most uh, projects entail as far as designer responsibilities and, cons and contractor responsibilities. This information is taken from the ABC guide specification that's about to be published by AASHTO. So uh, you, there's more information in that document when it becomes available. Uh, the designer is responsible for the design of the bridge. That's pretty uh, understood. But the, in addition to that, we need the designer to identify the appropriate pick points for the lift to make sure that the bridge can handle those pick uh, locations, it can handle the forces and moments. We also want the designer to determine the allowable twist in the structure or in some cases differential support uh, elevations. And, to, and specify that on the plans to give the contractor uh, rules to play with it as far as differential twist and differential support elevations. So we want the designer to analyze the bridge for the pick points to make sure it works and then state this on the plans. We also want the designer to do a preliminary SPMT layout. Uh, the reason for this is because in, in order to identify the pick points, you have to know approximately how big these transporters are and how many axles are needed to lift the bridge. So we want the designer to do a preliminary SP SPMT layout. The ABC guide spec gives guidance on the approximate size and carrying capacity of these machines. So there's enough information for the designer to do a preliminary layout. We also want the designer to look at staging areas and travel paths to make sure there's a reasonably flat travel path and a reasonably flat and large enough staging area to build the bridge off site. And the checking for flatness can be a critical aspect of this. So these are things that we need the designer to do. In contrast, the contractor has their own responsibilities. Uh, once these plans are issued, the contractor is required to design the temporary supports in the staging area. This type of work traditionally falls under the realm of contractor means and methods. Uh, designers, we ask them to show schematic false work uh, uh, details, representations on the plans. But the contractor is responsible for the final design. Now, the contractor is also responsible for the final SPMT layout and travel path check. Uh, there are, the machines that are used are quite uh, similar. There's four or five companies that make them, but there are subtle differences between the machines. So we want the contractor to finalize the layout of the machines and the travel path. We want the, the contractor to design all the false work and design, if required, a monitoring system to measure twist or deflections in the structure. And then if the contractor chooses to move the pick points, we will ask the contractor to analyze the bridge for the final pick points if they are moved. If they are not moved, in most cases, the contractor does not need to analyze the bridge as long as they can make the uh, pick points work uh, in their final design for their SPMTs.
But where does steel play into this whole world of SPMT moves? Again, the construction method is to build the bridge off-site on temporary abutments. The photo on the upper right shows a construction of uh, this bridge in Utah. You'll see the bridge is supported at its ends, at its final bearing locations. Uh, some innovative uh, work here. The contractor is using shipping container boxes for the temporary abutments. There's no reason you can't use these uh, boxes. They are actually quite strong. They're designed to handle approximately 80,000 pounds of, of mass, and they stack them eight or ten high on a ship. So you do the math and realize very quickly these things have very high capacity for supporting vertical loads. That's just an interesting thing where contractors can get creative with their temporary supports. But then you notice the photo on the, on the bottom is the exact same bridge being moved about a month later, and you'll notice it's being picked at a different point uh, away from the final supports. So that's the, the issue we need to deal with with SPMT moves. When it's being moved into place and set on the new substructure, we have to make sure the bridges uh, can handle these negative moments and will not be uh, experience significant cracking. Steel is a big part of this answer. There are significant bending moments in the beams. Steel can handle the reversals of bending moments uh, better than concrete in most cases. This diagram I'm showing now comes out of the ABC guide spec. It's also included in the Utah DOT bridge manual where they talk about the issues that designers need to look into when designing a bridge for SPMTs. And this diagram demonstrates the issues that I was just describing. If you look at the top line, this is when the girder is sitting on its temporary supports and the deck is cast, creating bending moments in the beams, which is the center column. The the forces in the deck, the moments acting on the deck, are zero at this point because the concrete is, is yet to cure and harden. The second line are any additional dead loads that are applied to the bridge while it's on its temporary supports. This would be uh, parapets and barriers. Um, perhaps even an overlay uh, would be added so the moments are increased. So now the deck is seeing some positive bending. And then the third line is when we lift the bridge uh, away from its temporary supports. And you'll see where the support locations S1 and S2 are moved inward. And the moment diagram, the resulting moment diagrams show that we create significant negative bending at the pick points. But also, if you look at the deck, we're creating negative bending moments acting on the deck. So we need to check this and keep the stresses within control to make sure that we do not create excessive cracking in the deck during the move. Uh, we completed a study for the Utah DOT looking at this, and our conclusion was that it was reasonable to assume about 15% of the span length where, where you should pick this bridge. So approximately 0.15L is a good place to start for looking to pick the bridge. Again, you have to look at the SPMTs and the width of the SPMTs and make sure that they can fit under the bridge and travel along the travel path and, and more importantly get under the proposed substructures and everything has to fit properly to uh, seat the bridge. The last line is important, though, as you see, after setting, once you set the bridge back down on its permanent supports, all the moments reverse again, and we're back into a situation where the deck is in compression and the beams are back into positive bending. Now, what does this mean? It means that the, even if a minor crack develops in the deck during the move, the, the cracks close after the bridge is set. Uh, we have experienced this in Utah, inspecting many bridges. We see some cracking in the deck, minor cracking in the deck, and the cracks close up tight once the bridge is set. So, bridge systems with steel beams. One other effect that we have with steel when compared to concrete is the simple weight of the bridge. When you go to design an SPMT system, the number of axles is a function of the weight of the bridge. The recommendation in the ABC guide spec, we're recommending estimating approximately 60,000 pounds per axle line. And we refer to these as lines in the business. And uh, the diagrams, uh, the three-dimensional graphic below shows different types of SPMTs. Uh, the lower photo is a six line. That's a single wide SPMT with six axles. The reason why they're called modular transporters is because we can bolt them together and create modular larger and larger uh, vehicles. The middle one is a 12 line. That's uh, two six lines that are bolted together and interconnected with hydraulics. That is now 12 axles. And then you get to the back one is 12 line double wide. You can bolt them side by side and end to end. So now we're looking at, in this case, uh, 24 axles, 24 axles times 60,000 pounds per axle. You do the math and realize you can lift very large structures with these uh, devices. They're very versatile. One thing to keep in mind with SPMTs is they are self-propelled. The power pack is shown on the back end of these diagrams. 
Uh, this is a, um, a motor driven with a hydraulic system to move these trailers forward and backwards. Uh, they can move all six degrees of, of movement. They can move X, Y, and Z direction. They can rotate. They can, um, all the axles can spin, and some uh, machines can spin 360 uh, degrees. So we have very versatile trailers that can move just about anywhere and really uh, fine-tune the movement to within less than an inch of where we need to place the bridge. So simply, steel bridges, they're lighter. Heavier bridges require larger false work and larger vertical loads and more axles. Simple, simple math will tell you that. Steel definitely has an advantage when it comes to that with regard to SPMT axle lines. So we get to NCIEEE Project 12-98. Uh, this is a multi-faceted uh, research project. One facet of the research re was with regard to tolerances. I'm not speaking about that today, but the other half was with re regard to dynamics of SPMTs. And the, the question that needed to be answered in this research was we've seen a lot of bridge moves, and as the bridge moves down the road, engineers are constantly asking, well, what about bouncing? We hit a bump. What's the, what are the effects on the bridge? What kind of bending forces and uh, are we imparting on the bridge during the move? And engineers were very concerned about bouncing. So the idea of this research was to look in at dynamic effects and to see what happens to the bridge and the false work during the move. Bouncing was a big concern, but the research team uh, that we, we were very concerned with starting and stopping. And the reason for that was we had ex witnessed a, a number of these SPMT bridge moves. And the machines are not moving at a uniform, even pace. They start and stop continuously during the move. And every time the machine stops, the entire bridge system, you can see it waving back and forth up in the air. And literally, we were really not capturing that in the design of the false work and the design of the SPMTs. Uh, not to be too alarming, though, because the experience of these companies that do these kind of moves, they had rule of thumb numbers that they were using. A lot of companies were using between 5 and 10% of the mass of the bridge and designing for a horizontal force is equivalent to that. Um, we wanted to study that, though, to see really what was the dynamic effects of starting and stopping and going over uneven terrain. And, uh, and the other thing we wanted to study is what was the effect of the weight of the bridge on the dynamics of the system. Would a heavier bridge be worse or, or better than a light bridge? So the research really was investigating all of these features of this particular type of ABC construction. So the team, we developed a hypothesis. And our hypothesis was that an SPMT bridge move was similar to a man-made earthquake. And the idea here is that the SPMT platform, the top of the SPMT, is the earth, and it's, and it's experiencing accelerations and decelerations during the bridge move. And these accelerations and decelerations are imparted on the bridge and false work during the, during the move. Now, the other question is, well, how do we account for the stiffness of the bridge, like if you're designing a bridge or a building for seismic, and how do we account for uh, the stiffness of the false work in the same uh, manner? So our approach was to take various loads, place them on an SPMT with accelerometers mounted on the SPMT. And the idea, we looked at various loads to see if there were different dynamics for light bridges versus heavy bridges. And then we came up with a pattern of uh, tests. We ran the SPMT on certain maneuvers. The idea behind these maneuvers was to look at all the typical maneuvers that we typically see with a bridge. Now, one thing we did do in the testing is we ran the SPMTs at fairly high velocity. The idea was we were trying to establish an upper bound for the forces that, are, that the bridge and false work might experience. Uh, you'll see from a video I'll show in a few minutes that we were moving quite a bit faster than you would expect to see a bridge move. These bridges typically move at slower than walking pace. We were going at a fast walking pace, which was the maximum speed for the units. So we measured accelerations, and then we determined the effective weight and stiffness on the system, and then did a lot of mathematics to come up with recommended uh, design guidance. So here's the test setup. Uh, the photo here shows a six-line SPMT. Uh, we went with three load configurations, 15% capacity, 25% capacity, and 50% capacity. Now you might say, why only 50% capacity? Well, that photo is showing with a 50% capacity weights. These are crane weights on top of the SPMT. You can just imagine if we had to go to 100% capacity, doubling the height of these weights would be really unstable and a little bit dangerous. So uh, we give thanks to Sarens Corporation. They gave us uh, use of their Houston yard, and they, uh, they gave us a crane to load these things up and let us borrow an SPMT for a day uh, to, to do this testing. 
the people you see on the SUNT are those are researchers from the uh, Utah State University who is part of our team looking at this work, and they are working now in hooking up gauges and getting the computers ready to go. On the right side, there are a pattern of movements that we ran these STMTs through. If you look at the numbers, STMT 1, 2, and 3 was essentially raising and lowering vertically the machine up and down. Uh, 4, 5, 6, and 7 were starting and stopping uh, patterns. We, we ran the machine from a dead stop, the maximum speed, to a stop again as quickly as possible, and then repeated it six times. Uh, I'm sorry, not six times, ten times. Uh, six times in each direction, I'm counting my arrows, uh, 12 total. And we looked at it going forward and reverse. We wanted to see if there was a difference between forward and reverse. As it turns out, there is. These machines stop better in one direction than another. SCMT move number eight was a turning maneuver with under full load, turning the bridge uh, 90 degrees. SCMT runs of nine and 10 were long runs of about 150 yards over fairly rough terrain. Again, we went at high speed, faster than you would normally take a bridge. Again, we're looking to establish an upper bound for the worst case scenario. And then SDMT move 11 was essentially rotating the machine in place. We call that carousel motion. So that was the testing uh, setup uh, parameters. Now what I have is a video showing the starting and stopping uh, testing that was done. I believe we're gonna see two, one, uh, two starts and two stops. Uh, with the load on the trailer, so we'll cross our fingers and see how it goes. Okay, this is the FCMC standing still. The operator is off the screen. He's got a cable uh, attached to the machine. So they get up to full speed right here, and then they put the brakes on. Sometimes they get them on really hard, and sometimes this one is a really slow stop. Now you'll see a puff of smoke come out of the machine, and then they'll go to full speed again. Okay. This time a little bit quicker. There it goes full speed, full throttle full speed and then he put the brake in. That was, that was a pretty hard brake right there. So what do we do with this data? And we took a lot of data, we took all the data from these verge moves, went through a lot of number crunching, and again I, I uh, give credit to Utah State University for doing this work for us. And what we did was we developed response spectrum curves similar to what you would use for designing a building for seismic or a bridge for seismic. We have two different response spectrums we developed, one for vertical and one for horizontal accelerations. Uh, the values in these charts, we won't get into the details. The, guide, the guideline we developed goes into much more detail, but we uh, calculate a peak platform acceleration, and then the guidelines we show here that there's a plateau in the lower um, uh, frequencies, uh, or lower periods, I should say, up to half a second in the case of vertical, and then after half a second, it drops off fairly quickly. So if you have a very flexible bridge, you can get reduced dynamic forces. Uh, and then for horizontal, you'll see up to three seconds, we have a plateau, uh, and then it, it reduces down from that. What we've realized through running some test numbers is that in most cases, you fall within that plateau. You're in that either less than half a second for vertical acceleration and three seconds period for horizontal. So what we've done in the guideline is developed uh, simplified equations where you can simply just pick a number off a chart with going by the assumption that you're working in that plateau up on top. From there, we, come up, we developed a method similar to the uniform load method in AASHTO for seismic to calculate the forces acting on the false work in the bridge. Uh, and uh, it's a fairly simple calculation. And we also then developed load factors, recommended load factors for analyzing the bridge for these dynamic effects. So where does steel come into play? Uh, what we did find out, though, is that the lighter weight on the SPMT, the accelerations do increase. Uh, trucks, uh, an SPMT is like a truck, it has brakes. The brakes have a constant force, uh, a constant braking force in them. Heavier loads slow down slower, meaning less, de less deceleration. Very lightly loaded trucks can stop very quickly. The reality of the case, it's not a big deal because in the reality of the case, we size the number of SPMT axles based on, we try to minimize the number of SP, SPMT axles. We try to get it um, where these, we're trying to save money and have the fewest axles possible. So we tend to load these things up. So the percentage of load in the SPMT is really not a big issue. What are the results? We did generate significant lateral forces. The starting and stopping turned out to be much more severe than the vertical bouncing. So uh, we developed these the uh, response spectrums we just showed. 
The forces are correlated with the weight of the bridge and the stiffness of the bridge and the false work. Very similar to seismic. So our hypothesis was proven correct. What about steel bridges? Lower weight reduces the number of axles. That saves money. Lower lateral forces reduces the, the cost of the false work. That saves money. And the, uh, <clears throat> the lower weight reduces the vertical forces acting on the beams and deck. So all that is a positive. So in general, when you're talking about SPMT bridge moves, uh, steel definitely has an advantage over concrete in virtually all situations. So that was the first form of ABC we were going to talk about today. Now I'm going to move on and talk to the second uh, type of major type of ABC in use in the United States, and that is prefabricated elements. Uh, we often refer to these bridges as Lego bridges. Uh, as you can imagine, building a bunch of pieces off-site, erecting them into position, and then connecting them in the field. So uh, smaller pieces, although we're not talking very small pieces, we are still looking at some pretty heavy uh, uh, pieces. This particular photo is from the 93 Fast 14 project in Medford, Mass. That's about approximately 85-foot span girder. It's, it's two girders with a precast deck on top. We refer to these units as, uh, there's two different types of reference to these units. Federal Highway calls them modular deck beams. Uh, a lot of the Northeast states refer to these as uh, PBUs, prefabricated beam units. Uh, essentially what it is is a double T made of steel and precast concrete. At 85 feet, these things get quite heavy, upward over 200,000 pounds. So you can imagine the cranes get quite large. Uh, the crane in this picture, I believe, is a 500-ton hydraulic crane lifting this as a single crane pick. So uh, you can see where steel would have an advantage. If a concrete, an equivalent concrete, say a double T, might weigh in 25% heavier, 25% would make it this crane probably wouldn't work, and we have to go to a two crane pick, which really complicates the erection procedure uh, significantly. So steel has a definite advantage. So the modular deck beams are very popular, and the basic reason why is the weight is less. The cranes are smaller, and in many cases, it's the only option as far as crane location and crane capacities. Steel, in many cases, is the only option that works for these type of modular construction projects. So the question comes up now, if I'm using, we'll go back to the previous slide. You look at this photo, you can see these are single span uh, beams. Well, we, we don't like using single span beams. We want to use continuous girders in modern steel construction. So the question is, how do we make a bridge that's durable, that doesn't have joints, but with simple span beams? So let's explore that right now. And this is a study that was done for NSBA, where we're looking at the effect of simple spans versus continuous spans on the design of the girders and the efficiency of the steel section and the overall cost of the bridge. There was a study that was done. Uh, there was an article published in Modern Steel Construction. You may have read it. We'll go through uh, some of the uh, results of that little study that we did and then have some recommendations for how to provide a very durable bridge using what we call span-by-span -span construction versus continuous construction. So conventional construction, what we were taught, I put here since the 1950s, if you go back to the bridges built on the interstate highway system in the 50s, a lot of them were simple spans with joints at every pier. So what were we taught in school, though? We were taught least weight is least cost. That's what I was taught, and uh, no uh, disrespect to my professors, I was, I was taught cont continuity is better than simple spans. It uses less structural steel. But as a bridge engineer, continuity eliminates deck joints at the piers, and the associated deterioration that can happen. Also, continuity refer, uh, results in fewer bearings at the piers. So the question I ask, is this really true? Is it really true that continuity is the best cost, the least cost option for a multi-span structure? You know, the question I ask here is, what is the true cost of a girder? The true cost of a girder is a combination of several factors. Fabrication, obviously, is part of it. The weight of steel in fabrication affects the cost. But then we've got to look beyond fabrication and beyond our calculator to say, what about transportation and erection? Continuous girders can be more difficult to erect. Uh, continuous girders require field splices. They require time and sometimes temporary, peer, temporary false work to support the girders during erection. And there's other items, too, that we need to consider in the design of a continuous girder with regard to uh, cost. So we're going to take a look at that. And our suggestion is we should take a look at the total cost of the bridge, not just the weight of the steel that we were taught in school. So what about bridge joints? I mentioned before the 1950s, we designed bridges, uh, we, <laughs> no, our predecessors designed bridges with joints at each pier. 
Uh, the bridge, the expansion joints are placed primarily to accommodate thermal movement in the bridge. Bridges, unlike buildings, are ex uh, exposed to significant temperature uh, variations, typically in the order of 130 to 150 degrees. The rule of thumb, at least in my, my eyes, uh, my calculations say that a 100-foot-long bridge will change length about an inch and a quarter over the year. That's significant movement. And so the old uh, engineers in the 1950s put deck joints in to accommodate these thermal movements. The fact with deck joints is they leak a lot. I, uh, I've challenged my staff to say, if you can come up with a bridge joint that can last 10 years and not fail and not leak, you'll be a millionaire because deck, deck joints, there are some very good deck joints out there. They're very expensive and they don't leak. But to get a cost-effective deck joint, it's hard to find a good cost-effective deck joint that doesn't leak. So I put down here, and this is my opinion, but I think a lot of people share this opinion that leaking deck joints are the number one cause of bridge deterioration in the United States. So we always want to eliminate bridge deck joints. They are problematic to the extreme. The photos shown on the right are a picture of a bridge in Massachusetts, uh, several different piers. You'll see in the upper picture, you see a lot of corrosion of the beam ends and also quite a bit of corrosion of the bridge pier underneath. The photo on the bottom, you can see the actual web of this girder has crippled. There was uh, over 75% corrosion in that web and it crippled down because there was not a bearing stiffener. We, we can't have this. We need to have bridges that function better than this and provide a 75-year life without significant maintenance. Uh, these two bridges shown here in these photos were probably built in the late, uh, mid to late 70s. They're not that old. Uh, they're, they're too young to be experiencing these kind of problems, so we need to get rid of bridge joints wherever possible. Now, up until now, continuity has been the approach taken. So let's take a look at what other options we have. We want to consider the term span-by-span -span construction, and this is where we erect the girders supported from pier to pier, and uh, so we end up with simple spans, but then we try to eliminate joints in another way. So the question is pre-stressed girders. Designers almost always use span-by-span -span construction and because splicing a concrete girder is more difficult than, say, splicing a steel girder. In most pre-stressed girder applications, they erect the girders from support to support, and they do a concrete closure pour at the piers to provide a jointless design. So the question is, why not for steel? Why can we not use span-by-span -span construction and have a continuous deck across the joint? We'll explore that in a few minutes. Now, what does this play into accelerated bridge construction? By using span-by-span -span construction, we eliminate uh, field splices for steel girders, which are time-consuming. So we can now erect prefabricated units, as we saw on a previous slide, with our, say, two steel beams and a deck. We can erect them very quickly and just make the connections at the ends and finish our bridge rather quickly. So we want to take a look at this as well. How can we make this work? This is a photo of a project, the same project we mentioned before in Medford, Massachusetts. This is a project called the 93 Fast 14 Project, a project that uh, we, were, we had a pleasure of working on. Uh, MassDOT challenged us to replace 14 bridges in 10 weekends. We were given 55 hours on weekends to close the highway down and replace a three and a four span bridge in 55 hours. Uh, modular steel elements got us there, and this is a photo showing the construction of one of the bridges. Actually, in the small photo to the right is a, uh, our aerial photo of this particular bridge. It's part of a large traffic circle, and you'll notice there are actually two bridges at the traffic circle, one on each, one on each end. Uh, I'm going to be showing you a video in a few minutes, and the video, the key thing to understand on this video is that uh, we're showing construction of one of the two bridges in the video, but the, at, during that weekend, the bridge on the other side of the traffic circle was also being replaced on the same weekend. So we replaced two three-span bridges in 55 hours using modular elements. So take a look at the video. I hope this plays well. If not, I could talk through it. So this is showing construction of the bridge starting on Friday night. Uh, the traffic has been diverted to the other side of the highway, and this company is tearing the bridge apart. Uh, you give a contractor space, they can tear a bridge apart very quickly. This is Friday night. The deck, another nice thing, when you have a deck that's deteriorated, it comes apart really quick. Here's a case where it's probably 3 o'clock in the morning. The deck is already off the bridge. They started at 9 o'clock at night. They're, the beams are virtually they're taking the last few beams out right now. And right about now, the, all the girders and the deck are gone. Now they're just cleaning up the site. The sun is starting to come up at this point. It's Saturday morning. If you look off in the distance, you'll see the prefabricated beam elements on trailers. The first crane's being assembled on the far side, approximately a 500-ton crane. 
The second crane is setting up down below. Now we're looking at probably 9 o'clock in the morning. Unfortunately, it started to rain at this point. Still not a problem. We move forward. And pretty soon you see the first piece go in right now in the far span. And there they go. There's six pieces in a cross section. The crane on the far side was done probably by 1 o'clock in the afternoon. He's already packing up and he's about to pack up and leave. The crane down below is erecting the end span and part of the center span. Again, these pieces are very heavy. At about halfway through the afternoon, the crane had to break down and move back about 30 feet uh, because they couldn't pick all the pieces from one location. But as you see, he's now completing the construction of the spans. He's got two more pieces to go in. And then the ants show up to do the closure pours. They're putting reinforcing and formwork between the units to be uh, in preparation for concrete pours. Uh, we developed a very highly strength concrete mix here. We developed a mix that has 4,000 PSI in approximately four to five hours. A very expensive, very high performance mix. Worked great. Uh, so here they are. Now we're looking Saturday night. The first concrete starts being poured about midnight, and I think that'll happen any second now. And right about now, the concrete's going in the first joint. They were pouring the highly strength concrete from about midnight till about uh, 10, 11 o'clock in the morning on Sunday. You can see there was a light rain falling at this time, which actually was beneficial for the setting of this concrete. And there we are getting close to 11 o'clock in the morning on Sunday, and the final concrete is in the hole. And now we have a time we're just waiting for concrete to gain strength. So by mid-afternoon, this concrete now has enough strength to drive trucks on it. You'll see the first trucks will appear on the bridge, and right now they're working on the approaches a little bit. You'll notice there are no parapets on this bridge. We put temporary jersey barrier in the shoulders, and the parapets were built after the uh, weekend closure. But here we are now, mid-afternoon on Sunday, and essentially the bridge is complete. Uh, they spent Sunday night doing more prep work on the approaches, but uh, in 10 weekends, Every, ten, every weekend, they finished the bridge in 55 hours and reopened. As a matter of fact, most weekends, they were finishing in under 48 hours. So that's a way you can use modular steel elements to build a bridge very quickly. And these are not small bridges. We're looking at three-span bridges uh, carrying four lanes of interstate highways. So these are not little uh, single uh, two-lane bridges out in the country. These are significant interstate structures. So what about deck joints? As I said before, we don't want to have construction joint, uh, uh, expansion joints on our deck. But how can we use span-by-span -span construction without deck joints? Well, one option we have is a concept called simple for dead load and continuous for live load. This is where we make a connection, essentially a moment connection at the pier. This has been done successfully, but you can see this detail is fairly complicated. It involves, in this case, post-tensioning, grouting, and a bolted splice at the bottom flange. It's all, this is all doable. You can do it, but it's quite complicated, and complexity brings about a potential risk of not finishing the bridge on the weekend. So uh, there's concerns about forming, there's concerns about tolerances with this design, and then there have been issues with some bridges with cracking under live load at the pier. So uh, this is one option if it's properly designed that can work. There's definitely more field work involved and more fit-up issues in the field. So let's look at a, a simpler solution, and this is a case where we're stealing a page from the precast concrete industry's playbook. These are uh, devices called link slabs. Uh, a link slab is a slab that spans across a pier joint that provides a jointless deck, but it's not a continuous design. You'll notice in the diagram to the right, the beams are not connected at the bottom. They're just running the slab across the top. The, uh, uh, the, they're very useful because in this case, you can see if I have two different size beams, there's not a big issue with, with uh, making this connection. Uh, again, we're not looking for continuity, so the details are quite simple. The purple line that you see in the diagram is a debond zone where we disconnect the slab from the beams over a distance of 5% of the span length on either side. And so for a short distance, we debond the slab, which essentially softens up the slab and allows it to accommodate end rotations without cracking. It's a pretty cool idea developed in the precast concrete industry that is definitely applicable to the steel industry as well. We'll get into a little bit of the theory. Uh, this was published in a paper. Uh, this is not new technology. Published in a paper in 1998 in the PCI Journal. Again, it's a concrete industry um, development. Basically, what we do is we calculate the end rotation of the girder, mostly live load, and then we can calculate the bending moment of being applied to the link slab caused by the end rotation. This is a fairly simple equation. It's not rocket science here. 
the key thing I always like to point out in this equation is is the fact that oh I'm gonna I'm gonna get my pointer out here one second bear with me is this term I that is the moment of inertia of the link slab in the transverse direction it's 1 12th pH squared pH cubed I should know that 1 12th pH cubed so the reason why I point that out is many designers when they go to design this type of connection want to be conservative and, the, and conservative means I'm going to beef up the connection I'm going to make that link slab thicker if you look, recall the previous uh, detail I showed you the slab was the constant thickness across the joint the same thickness as it would be on the main span which is typically around eight inches so if I'm a designer and saying I want to really strengthen my link slab I'm going to go to say a 16 inch thick link slab I'm going to double the thickness of the slab if I double the thickness of the slab I increase the bending moment acting on that slab by a factor of eight H cubed. So by making the slab twice as thick, I increase my moments by a factor of eight, which actually will lead to more cracking than if you kept it thin. In reality, making that link slab as thin as possible is the goal. That should be the goal of designing a link slab. So I like to point that out because a lot of people do uh, think of thickening up that slab. In reality, we should keep it nice and thin to make it more flexible to accommodate end rotations. Okay, what about skew? It's very unusual for us to build square bridges these days. Uh, an old-time bridge engineer once told me upon his retirement, his uh, words of wisdom to me were, don't build bridges on skew and don't build bridges on curves. Well, reality is that's just, almost, it's just about impossible these days. Virtually every bridge we build has some skew to it. Uh, but fortunately, there has been research on the effect of skew on link slabs. And the, the research has shown that skewed bridges actually reduce the beam end rotation. It has to do with the fact that the bridge deflects more like a diaphragm and less like a line girder. It works more like a plate, and that the deflection really is more of a function of the perpendicular distance between the supports, not the span distance between supports of the girders. So the research actually showed that skews up to 45, 50 degrees actually reduce the bending moments in the link slabs, and that it was actually very much uh, um, it's possible to go very large skews with link slabs without any significant change in your design or detailing. What we do recommend is when calculating rotations for link slabs to use the full span length of the beam measured along the beam, and that'll give you a conservative estimate as to live load rotation. And if you do that, your link slabs will be just fine. So uh, that has been uh, uh, a question asked many times of me, and I want to clear that up. Uh, other questions have some agencies have looked into some uh, fairly high um, um, uh, I'm trying to think of very sophisticated concrete mixes for these link slabs, which I don't think is required. Uh, typical concrete works very well. We have a very good track record of these link slabs. The bridges in Medford, Mass. have ADTs of upwards of 190,000 cars a day. They've been in service for about six years and they're doing just fine. So uh, the reality is regular concrete can work in virtually every case. Uh, let's go back to our previous equation, actually. You know, I know some people have actually gone back and used ultra-high performance concrete for link slabs, which have very high uh, uh, compressive strength. High compressive strength comes along with one thing. It comes along with a high moment of inertia. I mean, modulus elasticity, I should say. The high modulus elasticity will actually increase the bending moments acting in the link slab. Uh, fortunately, though, for UHPC, the material is so strong it could probably handle it. Uh, it's awfully expensive material. We have found in our experience that link slabs made with regular deck concrete function just fine. So other uses of link slabs or similar to link slabs are, are been around for years. Um, jointless decks are not new. They've been very common in the precast industry for over 20 years. Uh, I know for a fact, I, I've discussed this with engineers in Texas, at Texas DOT. Uh, they've been running the slab over piers without a specific link slab design for years. They refer to this as a poor man's continuity detail, where you essentially just run the slab over and just don't think about it. Just build a bridge. And they've had very good luck with that. Uh, for many years, they've had very good performance. I know for a fact that Connecticut and Massachusetts have done similar things, where they have had slabs, running slabs over piers without a specific link slab design. Uh, you might say, well, if I do a link slab, am I going to get a lot of reinforcing in the deck? And you'll see in a few slides we'll show that the amount of reinforcing for these link slabs is nothing significant. It's not, uh, we're not looking at number eight bars. We're looking at typical uh, number fives, number sixes. 
Uh, so not a lot of reinforcing is required to make these work. You run through the equations and uh, you'll see it's not as bad as you might think. Uh, while I'm talking about equations, I'd like to just note that the ABC guide spec that we developed for AASHTO uh, does include provisions for des the design of Lynx Labs. So if you're interested in designing a Lynx Lab uh, later this year, that document will be published and the design provisions will be available for all to use. So what does a completed Lynx Lab bridge look like? Again, this is the I-93 FAST-14 project in Medford. You don't see me cars in this photo because of the angle it was taken at, but again, this structure is carrying 190,000 vehicles per day. Uh, this, these bridges are a really good test to the durability of Lynx Labs, and again, they've been in service for six years and they're performing just fine. So it's a really nice looking bridge. You can see uh, the issue of having the approach span girders are shallower than the main span girders. Uh, Lynx Labs can accommodate that. They're super durable, they're easy to design, and now allow us to erect multi-span bridges without field splices, which saves tremendous time in construction, which again makes ABC work with steel a very attractive option for ABC in the world of uh, superstructures. So we decided for the, uh, when we wrote the article for NSBA, for the modern steel construction, we, wa we wanted to do a feasibility study. Because remember, we started this discussion by talking about uh, R is, is least cost equal to least weight, or could we build a bridge with span-by-span -span construction cost-effectively? So we did this little study, and we took an actual overpass and actually designed a, did a preliminary design of the overpass, and we literally did not uh, fudge anything to make one come up better than the other. In actuality, we pretty much, our hope was in the study was that the link slab bridge or the span-by-span -span bridge would be reasonably co close in cost to the continuous bridge. If it was reasonably close, it was probably worth going forward with it. So a little study we did, a cost comparison, looking at a simple spans uh, with span-by-span -span construction and link slabs versus a continuous span bridge. The key thing we did, though, is we looked at total bridge cost, not just the weight of structural steel, we, although we did consider the weight of steel, but we also looked at fabrication costs. Uh, the reality is the, the cost per pound for a flange is quite different than the cost per pound for a stiffener or a connection plate. We factored that into our analysis. The cost for field splices is significant. We factored that in. We looked at the cost of bearings, the fact that the span-by-span -span construction requires uh, two sets of bearings at the piers. And then erection and handling methods was part of our analysis. And then lastly, you might not think this is important, but you'll see, we looked at the reinforcing steel required in the deck. And the reason for this is that for continuous span bridges, we need to add longitudinal steel in the, de in the deck to control cracking. So uh, uh, we wanted to make sure we captured that as well. There's a structure we chose. We chose a two-span overpass structure, your typical bread and butter overpass structure, uh, spans of 122 feet and 122 feet. You might say, Mike, why 122, not 120? And the simple reason is, is that we are using a computer program that is available through NSBA, a program called Simon, for the design of these girders. One of the nice things when you download Simon, which, by the way, is free to download, it includes a bunch of input files, uh, sample input files that you can play around with. And one of the sample input files is a two-span bridge that spans a 122 and 122. We just took that, that input file and ran with it. I'm looking at a five girder bridge, two lane overpass structure with eight foot three girder spacing. So this is our, our example project. We try to pick a fairly real world bridge, nothing too exotic, nothing too simple, nothing too complex. Here's uh, details of what a continuous girder bridge would look like. As you see, there are bolted splices on either side of the pier. We typically place the splices near the inflection points. In this case, we chose locations such that the shipping of, uh, length of these pieces was reasonable. In this case, uh, the shipping lengths were about 90 feet or so, and then we had a drop-in piece over the piers. In actuality, construction would probably go the other way. We'd probably put the pier segment in first and then drop in the approaches, but that's part of what we we're looking to analyze as well, the construction methods. Here's a photo of a, a graphic showing the bolt of splice um, for this design. Now, this bolt of splice is actually designed using another NSBA program. Uh, NSBA publishes a program for bolt of splices on steel bridges. It's a great little program. It'll uh, quit very quickly design a bolt of splice for you. So the number of bolts shown in this picture are a reality. This is what you would get for this particular design. And you can see there's quite a few bolts there. And 
the key thing to keep in mind is those bolts do cost money, not for the physical bolts, but the simple fabrication, the drilling of the holes, and then in the field installing the bolts, ten tensioning the bolts, torquing the bolts. There's labor involved in all of that, and we wanted to make sure we captured that in our analysis. Now we look at the same bridge, though, with linked slabs and span-by-span -span construction. Now, to most people driving down the highway, they would not notice the difference between this bridge and the pre previous bridge. Uh, but uh, us experienced bridge engineers and structural engineers would note that there are no bolt splices and that there is a joint, there are uh, a small gap between the beams of the pier. I would contest that virtually everyone driving down the highway would not know any difference between this design and the previous design. So aesthetics, in my opinion, it's basically the same. One might even argue that eliminating the bolt of splice is actually a cleaner design than having this span-by-span -span construction. Another shot of what it would look like at the pier, you'll notice there are two bearings. In this case, we're showing elastomeric bearings, pretty standard in the steel bridge industry, and a small gap between the beam ends and, again, the link slabs spanning across the joint. There is no joint in the deck in this design. As, as I said before, we use the program, the girder design program called SIMON. It's an NSBA program that is, a, I'll give my pitch for it here, it's available for download for free. It is a very good program. I've been using it virtually my entire career. The first version of Simon came out in the, first, I started using it in the mid 1980s. It was a mainframe program, since migrated to Windows and on PCs, and again, it's available for free download through NSBA. Uh, it is a LRFD design program, so it's the current code, or usually it's within one version of the current code. NSBA does a good job of maintaining that. One key thing, though, is it does girder optimization. You enter in a girder, a perimeter design of a girder, and it can be a pretty rough perimeter design, and the program will cycle to an answer with an optimum girder size, optimum flange sizes, and optimum web sizes. So it's a, it gives you a very cost-effective structure, and it's great for this comparison because both designs were uh, went through the same optimization routines. Another added feature that we love, it does a cost analysis. And you can apply different costs for the webs, the flanges, sniffers, and connection plates to account for the fabrication effort for uh, a fabricator to weld in a connection plate. Uh, for instance, you know, adding a connection plate to a welded plate girder is a very labor, fairly labor-intensive process of fitting that connection plate in and then welding that conne connection plate in position. A lot of measurements, a lot of fit-up, a lot of uh, uh, handwork to do that, which is why stiffeners uh, we assign a quite, a quite a different cost value for stiffeners than we do for webs and flanges. As it turns out, the webs are probably the cheapest uh, steel on the, on the girder, but uh, you'll see the cost analysis can be done within the program by entering these factors in. And again, for bolt splice design, we located them near the inflection points, low moment locations, and we use the NSBA program, NSBA splice, to design that. As with the girder program, it's a LRFD design program based on the AASHTO code. Here's our result. This is the continuous bridge. This is the two-span continuous. It spans a 123, 122 and 122. We came up with a total weight of 143 tons for the girders, uh, girders and connection plates. Uh, the fabrication cost, we assumed the flanges were $1.13 per pound for fabrication, $0.97 cents a pound for the web, and you'll see $2 a pound for stiffeners. So we end up with a total cost of 310635 Now, I have a note on the bottom, and I can't stress this note enough. Costs vary greatly by region. Uh, bridges in the Northeast tend to be quite a bit more expensive than bridges in other parts of the country, so please, we're looking to do a comparison here. Do not take these numbers as being, this is what a bridge will cost in my neck of the woods. Uh, it varies quite a bit, and the, the cost variation is due to a number of factors, but again, we're looking for just to be consistent between these two designs to compare one cost to another. So please, don't freak out when you see these numbers. Like I say, if you're in uh, Texas, you'd think these numbers are ridiculously high. If you're in New York City, you would think these numbers are ridiculously low. So um, just take it for what it is. It's a comparison. On the right is the output from Simon, showing the weight of all the plates and showing the cost factors. And then at the bottom, it gives you the estimated bridge cost of 310635 And again, this is for the continuous girder design. But we go beyond the steel design. The cost of a bridge, again, is not just the steel. So we're going to look at other factors, such as the negative moment region deck reinforcing. When you design a continuous bridge, 
you need to add significant reinforcing in the deck to control cracking. And uh, it is, we're talking in this case here, a recommended 9.55 square inches of rebar per beam. And now we're proposing in this particular design of running that through the entire negative moment region. You can reduce the length of that in the Ashto code. You can actually do calculations and, and go uh, allow some of the uh, um, uh, portions of the negative, the, near the inflection points, you can allow that to go without additional reinforcing. But for this design, we went a little conservative and added a negative moment region of 74 feet. So with all these bars in the deck, we come up with a total weight of reinforcing needed is 12,000 pounds. Now we're using a cost factor of $2 per pound. Again, I'm using that as a northeast factor, which is consistent with the uh, cost that we used in the previous slide for the steel. So we come up with an extra cost of reinforcing of $24,000. Well, now let's take a look at the bolt of splice. Using the NSBA splice program, we designed the splice and we come up with 116 bolts per, per girder. So there's uh, quite a few bolts involved. Uh, we made a phone call to a uh, National Steel Bridge Fabricator and got a ballpark estimate for what is the cost of a bolt and a bolt of splice. And the recommendation for this study was to use $50 per bolt. This is a few years ago, so it might be a little higher now. But as you can see, it's significant. A bolt of splice costs almost $6,000 per splice. Um, what's shown down below in this uh, graphic is the actual output from the computer program, NSBA Splice. And uh, it's a great program, very easy to operate. You can generate these splices designed according to the LRFD code very quickly. I should note the LRFD code changed, uh, the design for bolt splices changed recently. Uh, I believe the NSBA program has been updated uh, to the uh, uh, current code. If not, it will be done shortly. I, I think it has been done. So it's a very good program, very quick design, very accurate. So I'll give my pitch for the program. But really, there, for this study, the answer is really how, how, many, how much does it cost to do a bolt of splice? In this case, it's almost $6,000 per splice. Again, costs vary widely by region. So let's look at the total cost for the continuous bridge. Steel cost was $310,635. Uh, additional deck reinforcing, approximately $24,000. Bearings, we used the number of $300 per bearing, so we end up with $4,500 for bearings. The bolted splice, there's 10 bolted splices in this bridge, $58,000 in splices. And then we threw in a number for shoring towers. We're assuming we might need two shoring towers, one at each splice. Uh, they're relatively cheap to build, but we're carrying a number of $20,000 for shoring. Uh, because in many cases, you can't, um, well, most contractors will choose to have a shoring tower as opposed to doing a flying splice in the air which really ties up a crane quite a bit of time. But we threw a number of 20,000 in. Again, this study was a general study. Every site will be different, and you can be more specific about your analysis. Our goal here is really just to see what is the relative cost difference between continuous bridges or span-by-span -span construction with link slabs. Well, let's get into that now. Now we're designing two simple spans at 122 foot each with a link slab. So the design of the girders when you use link slabs, the design of the girder is as if it was a single span. You neglect the bending moments in the link slab. It's essentially a simple span bridge, very simple design. We're using the same fabrication cost of $1.13 per pound for flanges, $0.97 cents per pound for webs, and $2 per pound for stiffeners. So with this, we get a total cost of $381,696. Again, costs vary widely by region, so do not take these numbers as specific to your region. If you recall, uh, this is more than the previous design. We'll get to that. I'll, go, I'll have a summary at a later slide. We'll talk about the differences side by side when we get through with this final design of this particular option. Talk about link slab reinforcing. As you recall, we had uh, 12,000 pounds of reinforcing for the continuous design. In this design, we're looking at link slabs. And instead of approximately 10 square inches of steel for the continuous design, we only need 3.3 .3 square inches of steel for this particular link slab. Uh, so we have about a third of the steel, but here's the most important part. The length of the link slab is only, in our case, eight and a half feet. So we're not looking at a link slab that's 40, 50, 60, 70 feet long, like the uh, continuity reinforcing was. We're looking at a very short region of only eight and a half feet for our link slab. So we calculate the total weight of reinforcing required. This is additional reinforcing for the link slab, and we only come up with 1,000 pounds much less than the 12,000 pounds we had for continuity. 
that's why it's important for us to look at reinforcing in the deck because it does affect the uh, overall cost of the bridge. So we've got a number of $2,000 cost differential uh, for the reinforcing for the link slabs. So let's look at our total cost now. Steel, structural steel is 381,696. Additional deck reinforcing, $2,000. Bearings, it's higher. We have more. We have five more bearings in this particular bridge, so we're at $6,000 for bearings. Bolted splices, zero. We don't have any bolted splices. And shoring towers, zero again because we're doing span by span construction. We don't need temporary shoring towers anywhere in the structure. So our total cost is 389. Well, your memory might not be as good as mine. Actually, mine's not good enough to do this, so I compare them together. So let's take a look at the, the comparison of continuous versus simple spans. So what we learn on steel cost, what your professor taught you in college, he was right. He was correct. It's significant that you save approximately $70,000 by going to continue, continuous design. So our, uh, we'll give credit to our professors. They taught us well. However, let's look at the total bridge costs again. If we go to link slabs versus continu continuous deck, we can save approximately $22,000 in deck reinforcing. We start looking at bearings. Yes, the simple span design with span by span, we spend on $1,500 more, but we eliminate $58,000 in bolted splices and $20,000 in shoring towers. And at the end of the day, the link slab design with simple spans is actually about $30,000 cheaper than the continuous design. Now, I imagine if you went through this sort of calculation with different bridges, you might get different answers. And in some cases, the continuous spans might be a little cheaper. But the key word is little, that the variation in the cost is not significant. We're talking a small percentage of the total cost. But the key thing is, is that they're at least close. And in many cases, the span-by-span -span construction might actually be cheaper. Uh, like we made assumptions on shoring towers as say if we decided we didn't need a shoring tower, for the uh, continuous girder erection, 20,000 goes away. The numbers get closer, but still, the link slabs with simple span, span by span construction would still be cheaper. So I got the sign there with the touchdown. We look at this as a winner. So the key thing to learn on this slide is cost should not be a deciding factor in whether or not you want to use span by span construction versus continuous span construction. You should not shy away from this form of accelerated bridge construction uh, just for the sake uh, for cost. Cost is not a reason to shy away from it. Um, and why does this fit into the world of accelerated bridge construction? It really comes down to span by span construction, as you saw from the video before, is a very fast form of construction. And using span by span construction with link slabs, we can really build bridges quickly and we're not spending a lot of extra money or even any extra money on the materials to pull the, the design off. So I wanted to uh, finish up this presentation. I have a few more slides. I want to show about certain uh, resources that are available or soon to be available. This particular uh, <coughs> document right here is the proposed guidelines for dynamic effects for bridge systems. This is essentially the guidelines we've developed to be used for develop for designing SPMT bridge moves and lateral slide bridge moves. Uh, these are uh, equations for designing for dynamic effects. This is the result of NCHRP Project 1298. Uh, this guideline is available right now online for free download. Uh, NCHRP used to charge for documents like this. Now you can actually go and download them for free. So if you just go to any search engine, such as Google or, or Chrome, and just type in NCHRP Project 12-98, it will instantly bring you to the website for the project. And you can download not only this guideline, you can download the research report, which gives you the basis for this guideline and where it was developed. So all the research that went into developing these uh, provisions are there. What's nice about this document, it is written in ASHTO format. It has uh, on the, a two-column format. The left side is the guidelines. The right side is commentary. And what we love to do with commentary is we actually, in most cases, have more commentary than guidelines. So there's a lot of good information in this document that will aid you in designing a bridge for self-propelled modular transporters or a lateral slide, taking into account dynamic effects that occur uh, during construction. And as I said before, they are significant. We are dealing with some significant lateral forces during these bridge moves, and we have to make sure we uh, account for it. 
the last thing in the world we need is to have a bridge collapse uh, during an actual move uh, when a machine operator puts the brakes on and uh, has the false work fail. We, we don't need that, and we want to avoid that. And that was what's nice about this particular research project. We now have data to back up the decisions we make for that design. So go to NCHRP, go to a website, search NCHRP Project 1298. You can download this document and you make use of it right away. The document also includes information on lateral slides. Uh, the key thing to note, the, the amount of dynamic effects that occur on a lateral slide are virtually zero. Uh, what we did study in this was look at different um, systems for sliding the bridge with regard to friction of sliding the bridge on either rollers or in some cases slid on sliding bearings. Uh, we did some research uh, with the help of Utah State University again. We actually tested different uh, devices for sliding bridges over to get the actual forces required to move the bridge. A very common uh, way of moving bridges is sliding bearings with uh, Teflon bearings. And the most popular form of lubricant that they use for Teflon bearings to date is dishwashing soap. Dawn dishwashing soap seems to be a very popular brand. Uh, we actually tested that. We tested Dawn dishwashing soap on Teflon bearings, and it did work very well. It reduced the friction dramatically. But part of our research, we also say, well, what about other lubricants? Why not we test some other stuff that exists, like maybe 10W40 motor oil? And we also tested grease that is used for bridge bearings. And lo and behold, the motor oil and the grease had lower friction values than Dawn dishwashing soap. So if you download this guideline, you're not going to find Dawn dishwashing soap in the guideline. We have it in the commentary. We do recommend using either 10W40 motor oil or bearing grease. They both work very well. Um, I've had people complain, not complain, had concern over the fact of using grease, that we're going to get grease on the ground uh, and potentially contaminating soil. And my response to that was they've never been on a bridge site when oil and grease are constantly being spilled on the ground when they lubricate machines, so I don't think it's a big deal. But if you want to use Dawn dishwashing soap, you can. You have to confer with these heavy lift uh, contractors that, that have experience with Dawn dishwashing soap to come up with the values that they should be using. The second major resource that's available that I want to make sure everyone knows about is the uh, AASHTO, the upcoming AASHTO guide specifications for accelerated bridge construction. This is a very comprehensive specification that was developed under NCHRP Project 12-102. It is written as a full guide specification as opposed to a guideline. The previous document was a guideline. Uh, guide specifications uh, have very specific language for how to design a bridge for ABC. And as I said before, this is a very comprehensive document that covers virtually every form of accelerated construction in use today. It includes equations for connections, how to design connections. It is, it is uh, uh, written in two parts. Part one is design specifications. Part two is construction specifications. So this report is not available. I mean, I should say this guide specification is not available at this time. Uh, AASHTO uh, has taken ownership of this document at this point. However, the report that generated this document is available for free download. Again, go to your web search, search NCHRP Project 12-102, You'll come to the project website, and you can download the report of, that outlines the research undertaken to complete this project. This project did not involve any actual laboratory testing. This project was a large synthesis of existing data that's out there today. We, um, we gathered hundreds and hundreds of research projects done across the country over the last 20 years, and then compiled them into a document and came up with design provisions based on that research. So AASHTO, the AASHTO Bridge Subcommittee, adopted this guideline in 2017, approximately one year ago. Uh, they held off on publishing the document because a number of states wanted to make minor revisions to the document. So over the last 12 months, uh, there have been a number of mostly editorial revisions to the document. And literally next week, uh, the revised version of this will be voted on at the AASHTO Subcommittee. And uh, the AASHTO publishing people have already got a hold of this document. They've already done the formatting. So literally in a matter of, uh, I'm hoping a matter of a month or two after the AASHTO subcommittee meeting, I'm speaking for AASHTO, I'm hoping that it will be published this summer, maybe the fall, uh, worst case early next year. So it does take some time to get these things out. It will be available through AASHTO, the AASHTO bookstore. It unfortunately will not be free. You'll have to pay for this. Uh, I imagine it will be a nominal fee. 
This specification, like the other one, is written in ASHTO format with, with uh, design specifications and construction specifications on the left column and significant commentary in the right column. Again, we cover all aspects of ABC, including the first couple slides that I included about uh, responsibilities for designers and responsibilities for contractors. That's included in the specification. We actually have a section on detailing requirements for ABC, and we have a, a, and we include provisions for dynamics, and we make reference to the other NCHRP documents for designing for dynamics. So all this is available, soon to be available for all engineers. So in the near future, we'll have some great specifications available where people can now design ABC projects, hopefully using structural steel, as we've hopefully demonstrated today the benefits. So in conclusion, <clears throat> steel beams are inherently lighter than concrete beams. I think that's the most obvious statement that we can say today. We all understand that. So span, uh, span by span, structure to structure, steel beams are lighter than concrete. What does that reduced weight do for us, especially in the world of accelerated construction? We require fewer SPMT axle lines. That is savings right there. There's money involved. Those machines you pay essentially by the axle to have them available. Uh, we also generate lower forces during the move. The dynamic forces experienced by the SPMTs, the false work, and even the bridge are lower with steel than with concrete. If you're using prefabricated elements, you can build the same bridge with smaller cranes which in many cases, like the FAST 14 project in the demonstration, the, the design of that whole project revolved around the cranes and the size of the cranes. Had those elements weighed 10 or 15 percent more, the whole design would have changed dramatically and would have gotten a lot more expensive. So steel definitely can affect the cost of cranes and the size of cranes. And therefore, it's worth trying to save 10 or 15 percent on the weight of an element by going to structural steel. Steel beams can accommodate lifting forces. Uh, we hopefully have demonstrated in this presentation that there are cases in ABC where significant negative bending moments are applied to beams, or in the case of the arch bridge in Providence, significant force reversals during the lift and move. Uh, concrete can handle that, but steel can handle it much better. We have much more uh, uh, flexible material and resilient material that can handle these reversals. Uh, as we all know, concrete is very good in compression, but not so great in tension. Steel is great in both tension and compression. Let's take advantage of that. Lastly, span-by-span -span construction works well with ABC. We can build a bridge in a weekend using span-by-span -span construction. Link slabs are the key. We can do simple designs. Link slabs, very durable, very easy to build, cost-effective, jointless bridge that will last 75 years, at least 75 years. So that's definitely an option that we should be considering. And these modular steel beam units are very versatile and very feasible. Uh, a number of these bridges have been built in the Northeast and around the country now. I've seen, I've heard of projects in Tennessee and, and further out where these are becoming very popular uh, form of ABC construction. And the conclusion is weekend construction is very, very reasonable, especially with steel elements and steel beams. With that, that concludes my presentation. I'll turn it back over to Nate and uh, we'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. All right, Mike, uh, thank you very much. We, we do have some questions that we've received from the audience that we're going to get to. But first, we're going to walk through a couple of interactive polling questions to make sure that the audience has grasped some of these key concepts. So the audience can feel free to participate by clicking on their screens uh, the correct answer to this question. The first question is, what can be done to offset the extra cost of simple span construction? Is it A, eliminate bolted splices, B, eliminate temperature or temporary shoring towers, C, reduce reinforcing deck in the or reinforcing steel in the deck, or is it D, all of the above? Again, the question is, what can be done to offset the extra cost of simple span construction? So Mike, the answers are coming in, and I'm going to close the poll here. I, see, I can see the results. <clears throat> and it looks like the audience feels overwhelmingly that the answer is D, all of the above. Uh, did they get that question right? The answer is the audience is overwhelmingly paying attention. Yes, that is the correct answer. 
all three items, save on all three items. And this is the cost. We're offsetting the cost of the extra steel and the girders with simple span construction. All right. One more interactive polling question. What makes steel an excellent choice for ABC? Is the answer A, reduced weight for shipping? B, reduced shoring and lifting costs? C, steel accommodates lifting stresses? Or is it D, all of the above? Again, the question is, what makes steel an excellent choice for accelerated bridge construction? And we're going to go ahead and close the poll. And in this case, it seems like we have a unanimous answer. Uh, Again, our, our, our students have paid attention. The answer is D, all the above. Uh, steel is excellent for all the reasons noted here uh, in this A, B, and C. So all the above is the answer. All right. Good job, everybody. So we'll go ahead and move forward with some questions that have come in from the audience. First question comes in on the link slab design. So I went to slide 35. Okay. And the question is, uh, do you have any uh, ideas of references um, for link slabs on, on SKUs? Or is there anything else you can comment on regarding uh, link slabs on SKUs? Yeah, uh, I, off the top of my head, I do not, but there are references. Once the, uh, when the AASHTO guide specification is published later this year, uh, part of that uh, publication includes references, and we do have the references for those studies that were done. I believe they were done by, uh, in Michigan, and uh, Western Michigan University, from the, this is off the top of my head, I think that's where it came from, uh, did the research. They've done a number of research projects on Lynx Labs in Michigan. So, uh, but when you get the AASHTO document, it'll be in the uh, reference section. The, uh, the, the particular provision on Lynx Labs will reference that research project. And by and large, these research projects are available online. You can download them. All right. The uh, next question is also on Lynx Lab usage here on slide 36. The mm -hmm. question is, what type of concrete was used for overlay on finished deck in these bridges in Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Texas? Good question. Uh, the, the answer is different for each state, but uh, I'll start with Massachusetts and Connecticut. Uh, the Northeast, uh, we have a fairly uh, consistent use of bituminous overlays, asphalt overlays in the Northeast. Um, we, t we typically use a... Uh, uh, waterproofing mem well, we don't typically, we demand that we use a waterproofing membrane between the overlay and the concrete deck. Uh, the quality of the membrane is critical to the performance of the system. Uh, I'm a big fan of asphalt or bituminous overlays. Um, they're also very good when you're using ABC and modular construction because even at your best efforts, you're going to end up with a deck that's not perfectly smooth. Uh, you can diamond grind decks to make them smoother. But what the asphalt overlay does for you, it allows you to have uh, a very smooth riding surface. The, it's your last adjustment of tolerances when you put that asphalt down. Uh, now, I know a lot of states are using bare concrete decks, and that's, that can be done too. You could use a concrete overlay over a link slab. I don't see any reason why that wouldn't work as well. Uh, just to compare, though, uh, a few years ago I was uh, speaking overseas. I was in Stockholm, Sweden, actually, talking about accelerated construction. It was, it was kind of like the ABC Olympics. There was somebody there from every, every country that does ABC, and it's virtually all the European countries, and I was there representing the U.S. And I, I was showing pictures of, uh, pre, of deck replacements using precast concrete, and the question was asked to me of why we were replacing bridge decks in the United States. That they said their bridge decks were lasting the life of the structure. And I said, well, what do you use for protection? And they all unanimously said, unanimously said, they use membrane waterproofing systems with asphalt overlays are, have been standard for many, many years in Europe. So they've got good track records with it. In Connecticut, we've been using uh, asphalt overlays with membranes since the 1960s. We've had very good performance here as well. So uh, I, I encourage engineers to consider asphalt overlays on bridges for ABC projects where you're not going to get the most smooth bridge in the world because of tolerances. Uh, but if you want to have a concrete deck, you can diamond grind these decks. That'll work. 
Or if you want to use a concrete overlay, you could do that as well, a thin concrete overlay. Or you can do what Utah does, is they diamond grind and they put a thin polymer overlay about a uh, three-eighths of an inch thick. So they all work. Uh, it, it really doesn't affect the, the Lynx Lab performance. All right. The next question, also related to Lynx Lab usage, is are joints typically introduced in the concrete barrier walls when Lynx Labs are used? That's a great question. The answer is yes, you should put a joint in the barrier wall at those points because you are having a live load rotation occurring at that joint. So if you look at the photo, thank you, uh, Nate, for bringing up this photo. If you look carefully at the pier, there's a tree in the way on the near pier, but the far pier you'll see there is a joint in the parapet right over the Lynx Lab. So we would recommend having a joint in the barrier at that point too. Uh, what's typically done on the northeast with that joint, the inside of that joint is usually caulked with a silicone sealant uh, to prevent water from going through that joint. Um, so it's, and as far as long-term maintenance, that caulking, maybe every 20 years or so you may have to replace it, but it's a simple caulking of a joint. It's not a, a reconstruction of a bridge joint. So, um, yeah, the good question, and uh, I'm glad it was asked. You should put a joint in the parapet. question about the uh, cost comparison that you did between continuous spans and, and simple spans. question is, what about costs, uh, erection uh, costs associated with crane usage, especially for the span-by-span -span case? Mm -hmm. um, are they included in, in this cost comparison? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, we we've, we've kind of factored it into the, um, the steel cost, but Reality is, yeah, it may, we might be a little bit off on our numbers, uh, although we have found that uh, having a crane on site is a cost. The size of the crane doesn't have a tremendous effect on the overall cost. The fact of setting up a crane uh, is the major driving factor. So, yeah, probably a little bit of adjustment for the size of the crane required for these heavy lifts. Um, so that's a good question, and I, I, I bow down to the fact that we probably didn't quite get all the costs in there, but. Even if we throw in the cost of those additional cranes, we're probably still looking at a wash as far as the cost of these two structures, which, again, was our goal in the study, was to make sure that we were in the same ballpark. Okay, shifting uh, focus a little bit in the next one, uh, back to slide 23. The question is on these, on these uh, curves here, what mm -hmm. is the PPA uh, acronym right. referring to? It refers to the peak platform acceleration. In the world of seismic, it would be equivalent to your peak ground acceleration that you would have uh, for um, an earthquake. So uh, it's a similar terminology used in seismic engineering, at least for bridges. And uh, there is an equation in the guideline for the PPA. And it's a function of the, uh, we equated it to the percentage of capacity of the SPMT. So if I have an SPMT that's got a capacity of 60 kips per axle, and I've loaded it up to say 40 kips per axle, and I'm at 66% I'm at of capacity. I push that into an equation, and I calculate the peak platform acceleration. So it's, it's an equation. It's in the guideline. Uh, once you calculate that, then you, you generate these, uh, you go to these uh, spectrum curves. And actually, you don't really have to go to the curves. The equation that's presented in the, in the uh, curve portion is the actual equation that we use to calculate the, uh, um, the, uh, the acceleration maximum for the structure, for the system, I should say. I, I, didn't, I didn't want to get too deep into that in this presentation. It really wasn't about dynamics. I just wanted to introduce people to the concept that dynamics do exist in these movements, and there is a guideline available to design for it. And again, luckily, this one here you can download for free, so it's available. Um, by the way, in that guideline, just in case people are a little nervous about this, in the appendix of the guideline, we actually have some examples. We actually went through a design example for uh, calculating dynamic forces in a bridge using the equations. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll do one final question, and this is just a general question on these SPMT moves. What is the general range that these SPMT moves occur? I mean, how far away? or how far do these SPMTs generally actually move a bridge? Good question. I've seen as little as 50 feet where the bridge was built alongside. 
this move 50 feet into position. And I've seen the photo on the lower right is probably the farthest. That's over a mile that was built. Uh, the staging area was a mile away from the bridge site. It was a nice staging area, nice flat wide road. Worked perfect. So uh, every site is different. In general, the rule of thumb we see, the move is usually less than like 100 or 200 yards. You try to find a staging area fairly close by, but in urban environments, you may have to travel a little bit to get to the site. It could be half a mile or more. Um, one thing I should note, though, is people are always concerned about driving over utilities with these things. You might, get, and the utility companies get very nervous, but the reality is the tire pressure loads that we apply to the roadway is really about the same as you would have with a fully loaded truck. So. Uh, for pavement design and utilities, it's not an issue. We've driven these things over utilities many times. Some utility companies will make a steel plate over their utilities just to be conservative, but the reality is uh, you can drive these across underground utilities all the time. All right. Thank you, Mike. That's all the time we have for today's questions. If you submitted questions we didn't get to, in our live session, rest assured that we did receive them and we'll work with Mike to respond to those questions in the coming week. Uh, before we break, I'm just going to go over very briefly how attendees can claim their PDHs for everyone at their connection. So just a reminder that within two business days of today's session, you will receive an email with information on how to report your attendance and ultimately claim your PDHs. You will receive this from the email address registration at AISC.org. That email will contain a link to an online form. Use that link along with your AISC website username and password to report the attendance for you and everyone else at your connection. PDH certificates will then be emailed out to the individuals that attended. In a moment, the webinar will end and a survey will actually immediately pop up on the screen for each of you. Please help us out by completing our survey form. It's very short but very helpful to us in providing this type of continuing education programming for you all. A special thanks to our presenter today, Mike Colmo, and thank you to, to you all for your participation. Have a good rest of your Tuesday. We hope to see you at the next AISC Live webinar.